Hello everyone and welcome to Crown Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic, we review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sabba Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today is another RCT day. Uh, we're going to have a look at another randomized clinical trial recently published in the BJS, followed by a, a further teaching session by Professor Saba Balasubramanian uh, on randomized clinical trials, uh, an overview. Right, so tonight we are going to talk about a paper that was recently published in the BJS, uh, March 2020, entitled Perianal Block with Ropivacaine as a supplement to anesthesia in proctological surgery, a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial, aka PERCEPT. Uh, this trial comes from Basel, uh, a city, one of the biggest cities in Switzerland, uh, my neighboring country. Uh, so, uh, first of all, Josh, uh, what do you think about this title? Uh, engaging, interested in the topic? Yeah, um, it's an interesting topic um, because Number one is a very common procedure, and um, and there's a lot of variation in practice in reality, and I think um, it's, there's an interesting point in the introduction bit of the paper where it says that um, hemorrhoidectomy is actually more painful than um, um, append appendectomy, cholecystectomy, or even a kidney transplant. So. It's obviously something quite quite interesting to know how we can improve um, patients' outcome or uh, experience. Absolutely, and uh, every colorectal surgeon you work with will have a specific way of doing uh, these type of blocks. So it's interesting to see if this paper can shed some um, evidence-based light and maybe change our practice. Right. So let's have a look at their aims. Uh, so the aim of of this work was to compare pain 24 hours after proctological surgery in patients undergoing general or regional anesthesia with and without a perianal block using ropivacaine. So Josh, uh, if you were to elaborate this in a PICO format, what would it sound like? So um, the patient will be a um, patient undergoing protocolical surgery with um, GA and spinal. The intervention they're trying to do is a, is a perianal block using uh, ropivacaine in addition to the GA and spinal. The comparison is a placebo group, and the main primary outcome they're measuring is their pain score at 24 hours post-op. Fantastic, wonderful. Uh, on a side note, what do you think about the Ropivacaine choice? Um, it's an interesting choice. They, they obviously wanted something that is long-acting and also less cardiotoxic, um, but it's not something um, very well used in the in the country. I don't think it probably wouldn't be something that you use. Um, what it wouldn't be the first thing you take from the anesthetist drawer. Yeah, definitely not the most popular local anesthetic, um, at least in the places I worked. However, it is some a relatively popular choice. Right. So. Uh, Let's dig into their methods. Um, so as I mentioned originally, this is a prospective double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial. Uh, they recruited patients between January 2018 and April 2019. They were 18 years old or older, undergoing perianal uh, surgery. Um, when they say perianal surgery, they mean a, a, a fairly sizable uh, different types of procedures um, from uh, hemorrhoidectomy to fistula surgery to fissure surgery. We'll go into a little bit more details about it later. And uh, they uh, randomized patients in a one-to-one -one ratio to two groups. Uh, the lucky ones uh, getting a perianal block with ropivacaine 0.5 percent, 40 mils, uh, and the not so lucky ones um, that uh, received saline uh, instead. But let's have a proper look at how uh, the actual process was carried out. So patient went into the anesthetic room and had either a general anesthetic or a spinal anesthetic. Following that, the anesthetist uh, picked the envelope uh, containing the uh, allocation of the patient and did not show any of that to either the surgeon or the scrub nurse. 
A study solution, so uh, a, a syringe level study solution, was then passed on to the scrub nurse and then to the surgeon that performed the block. Uh, so that means that the surgeon and the scrub nurse are completely blinded to uh, what solution has been administered. Following that, the patient uh, wake up, goes to recovery, or just goes to recovery if they had a spinal, uh, and they receive uh, a, a standardized set of uh, analgesics uh, and a specific trained a uh, pain assessor uh, goes in uh, and assess uh, their pain on a numerical scale. Uh, now, uh, as you can see from the table, uh, it's not exactly the standard set of medications we would use. Um, what do you think, Josh? Yeah, um, so um, this is a, um, as the title suggests, this is a, a precept, um, and precept is actually an organization or a, a kind of guideline writing organization in the Europe. And they basically return some guidelines for um, procedure specific and um, post op analgesic. So, as you can see, something that we'll use commonly will be opiate and um, calococcid, possibly. Um, in here, metronidazole is used as an um, uh, analgesic instead of an uh, antibiotic, really. Um, and then everyone also get metamazole, which is actually uh, not licensed in the UK, it's actually banned in the US and also uh, Japan. Um, so on the percept guideline, I also read other things at uh, GEO. Um, they also advocate things like um, deosamine, which is actually a uh, phabotonic medication, which is something that you can, you can buy from Holland Barrett. But generally speaking, I think um, these medication that they advocated, some we don't use or we can't use in the UK. Absolutely. Uh, there's a little bit of a you know, threat to validity in applying this, this protocol to a UK reality. The, the uh, sort of external validity of the study might be compromised here. Though it's worth noting that metamizol was uh, my go-to headache medication when I was a kid. So, and I grew up fine. Right, uh, let's have a look uh, at uh, the outcomes they used. Um, so, uh, as the uh, aim suggests, the primary outcome is pain at 24 hours, and they use a numerical uh, scale, uh, 0 to 10, fairly standard to assess that. Secondary outcome, uh, there's, they're split in two groups, uh, in-hospital outcomes and out-of-hospital outcomes. In-hospital outcomes include pain at 1, 2, 3, 6, and 12 hours, and use of rescue analgesia in terms of morphine and uh, diamorphine and or diamorphine. Uh, there's a few other out-of-hospital outcomes that were collected throughout the 14 days after the procedure. Josh, uh, do you uh, want to guide us through this? Yeah, so it, it's basically their pain score, daily pain score at rest, um, and also their maximum pain score. Um, the usage of the, the OPA that they were prescribed is also, um, um, a self, uh, these are self-reporting symptoms, by the way, uh, self-reporting um, figures, by the way. They also have quite a few um, uh, questionnaires. Number one is a SF12 questionnaire, which has got two parts. One is a mental part um, about mental health being, and another one is a physical part. They also have another questionnaire, which they have documented about protological symptoms. And eventually um, they have uh, looked at that complication, major and minor complication at 14 days post-op. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, quite a few questionnaires and quite a few self-reported outcomes uh, in diaries, and we'll see now how that worked out for them. Uh, so uh, overall, um, 138 patients uh, were uh, randomized into groups, uh, 69 allocated to rapivacaine and 69 to placebo, which actually is exactly the number of patients that they were supposed to enroll based on their power calculation. Uh, all the patients that were allocated to a group received the intervention that they were allocated to. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is um, only a minimal difference in the number of patients that underwent general anesthesia in one group uh, versus the other. Uh, all patients reported outcomes uh, at 24 hours, but they had a quite significant dropout uh, for the 14-day uh, um, diary um, outcomes. Uh, 16 patients out of 69 in the Rupivacaine group and 19 out of 69 in the placebo group, and obviously the analysis uh, suffered from that. Uh, but let's have a look at how uh, those uh, groups um, compare to each other, uh, shall we, Josh? Yeah, so I, I think looking at the top half of this table, uh, each group have got 69 um, patients. There is a power calculation, obviously, 
and and the baseline characteristic um, on um, both groups are comparable. Um, there is obviously a glaring error on the uh, placebo group regarding fem uh, male and female ratio. I hope you can pick that up. Um, Gio, can you tell us more about um, the procedure that they have done then? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think uh, this is another another important point in terms of external validity of this study. Uh, the vast majority of these patients underwent either a staple, a staple demoridectomy, and the last time I've seen a staple demoridectomy was back in Italy uh, about seven years ago. Um, and the hemorrhoidectomy that they list without specifying is a Ferguson closed hemorrhoidectomy, uh, as opposed to, uh, well, a Milligan Morgan open hemorrhoidectomy uh, or a ligature hemorrhoidectomy. Uh, the remaining procedures are fairly standard, but this is not exactly what we would normally see here in the UK. So let's go back to, uh, to our presentation. Um, most important outcome really here uh, is the primary outcome. So uh, they reported a statistically significant difference in uh, uh, pain perception at 24 hours between the two groups, where the Europivacaine group uh, scored 1.1 versus 2.3 on average. Um, however, conducting a subgroup analysis, they realized that that difference persisted only for the GA patients and not the regional anesthesia patient, the spina patient. Um, it's quite relevant uh, because obviously the study is not powered to uh, pick up uh, a specific difference between the two groups. Two groups. So moving on, um, there's quite a few uh, secondary outcomes that they report as well, don't they, Josh? Yeah, so they, they, they measure, so give us some interesting um, outcomes, really. So um, in at one hour postoperative, there's no difference between the two groups. Um, but at two, three, six, twelve hour post op, the um, the Robifican group has less pain, significantly less pain. And um, in in terms of the daily mean um, uh, uh, pain score and the daily maximum pain score, the Robifican group um, has better, uh, has less pain basically. Um, but there's no difference when they're at rest. And um, in the Robifican group, they take less morphine post op. Um, so that's another thing. And um, in terms of um, their general health being, um, in the Wolpifungen group, um, their um, physical score uh, remained the same in both groups. But however, in the placebo group, um, actually their, their quality of life, uh, physicality kind of, kind, of, kind of measure in the placebo group has declined postoperatively, even at 14 days post-op. Uh, in, ter in terms of the protocology symptoms, uh, the Wolpifungen group got better quicker. So these are the major uh, finding in the um, secondary outcome. Very true, fantastic. Right, uh, let's talk about the limitations of this study. Well, the vast majority of this we've discussed throughout our presentation. Uh, the prospect protocol, we talked about the uh, analgesia choices that uh, were made, uh, and we mentioned this might not be replicable in the UK. We mentioned that only GA cases seems to uh, benefit significantly uh, from a Dropivacaine block. They had a very significant dropout rate at 14 days, as we mentioned. And there is a further important point here that is the subjectivity of the outcome measured. Well, pain is a subjective uh, measure in itself. Uh, this is partially uh, corrected by having blinded uh, and trained assessors during the hospital stay. But obviously, anything that re that's reported uh, in the patient diary is even more prone to potential subjectivity uh, issues. Uh, there's a few other issues that uh, we um, picked up, uh, right, Josh? Um, yeah, so uh, as, as we go along, when I went along, uh, we found that um, medication they have used um, or procedures they have done is not something that is not exactly the same as what we usually do in the UK. Um, there is an interesting choice uh, or interesting d discussion about how they did a uh, perianal block and then there are different rates, uh, rate, uh, rate, uh, um, ways of doing it. Um, and there is also debate about volume uh, or the choice of local anesthetics. And um, yeah, that, that's basically all the um, limitation I think we found in this study, Gio. Yeah, um, absolutely, yes. Uh, cool. So uh, getting to our conclusions, um, in the words of the authors, we can say that a perianal block with long-acting local anesthesia should be recommended as an adjunct to general or regional anesthesia for proctological uh, surgery. And this is a quick perspective summary uh, of uh, the uh, points that we made throughout uh, the presentation.
So that's about it for us. Thank you very much. Right. We're going to talk about randomized control trials again. And let me close this. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. So we looked at randomized control trials in the last tutorial, and we ran through uh, the introduction of randomized control trials. We talked about why we need randomized control trials. We talked about the fact that they form the basis for level one evidence. We talked about clinical equipoise, and we started talking about methods of randomization, and I described simple randomization. So before we go any further, let's revisit the example from the last tutorial. So we talked about randomizing patients with low risk differentiated thyroid cancer into having either a total thyroidectomy or a hemithyroidectomy. And I briefly mentioned that, this, that there is a lot of controversy in this area, and uh, we still do not know uh, what the ideal treatment is for this group of patients. We mentioned that there are a number of factors that would affect outcomes in low risk uh, thyroid cancer. And a couple of factors uh, we talked about where gender, uh, male patients being um, at a slightly higher risk of recurrence, and tumor size. T1 tumors, i.e. tumors of size less than two centimeters, um, obviously being associated with a better prognosis compared to T2 tumors. And both T1 and T2 tumors fall in the low risk category. So that's the scenario to keep in the back of uh, your minds while we discuss uh, the principles of um, randomization and blinding in a bit more detail. Right. So the things to remember when it comes to randomization is the, is the objective. And as I discussed before, the key objective of a randomized controlled trial is to reduce, uh, reduce selection bias, which in turn will ensure that the participants in the two arms of the trial are comparable. Now, there are two main components to randomization. The first is the generation of a random sequence at the start of the trial. And the second is to maintain allocation concealment, which simply means that the investigator enrolling patients into the trial is not aware of the random sequence. Or in other words, the investigator does not know what comes next. And therefore, um, uh, he or she is less likely to be biased towards enrolling patients into the trial. Okay, so with this in mind, we also briefly talked about simple randomization. And I said that uh, in simple randomization for a trial where you're randomizing patients to one of two treatment groups, i.e. in this scenario, hemithyroidectomy versus total thyroidectomy, you generate a random sequence, usually by means of a computer um, generated um, sequence or software, like the one that we've heard um, in the paper presented and you allocate patients to either a hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy um, in the example that we've discussed. Now, the problem with simple randomization um, is this. As you see in the figure, the number of patients in the hemi arm and the total arm are unequal. We have, as a consequence of simple randomization, got 17 patients in the total arm and 13 in the hemi arm. And also, as you can see in the figure, there are a lot more females in the total arm and a lot more T1 tumors in the total arm. So this is, uh, these are known problems of simple randomization. And uh, you really don't want to do a trial where right at the outset, you've got a problem in randomization in that you have unequal numbers and the prognostic factors are not well distributed. Right, so what do we do uh, about the problem of unequal number in, uh, numbers in two groups? I mean, a common question I've heard uh, a few times is why can't we enforce equal numbers in the random sequence generated? <coughs> Sorry. We can, but once you start enforcing equal numbers, if you ask the computer to give you 15 totals and 15 hemis, then the sequence becomes predictable. And once the sequence is predictable, you can't ensure allocation concealment i.e. you can't make sure that the investigator who enrolls patients doesn't know what comes next. And that will lead to selection bias. So just to take this a bit further and explain this in a bit more detail. So if you say to the computer you want 15 hemis and 15 totals in random sequence, 
then by the time you get to the end of the trial, it'll be very easy for the investigator to predict uh, what, what will come next. So in this example, the last five patients have been allocated to total thyroidectomy. And by the time you come to the end of the trial, you've done 25 patients, you know that it's only total thyroidectomy left in the sequence. And then you might be predisposed to, or if you're biased towards one procedure or the other, you may or may not enroll patients and that you think may not benefit from a total thyroidectomy. So that's the problem with enforcing equal numbers in the random sequence that you generate in simple randomization. <coughs> okay, so the solution for this problem of unequal numbers is what we call block or permuted randomization. So what that means is that you randomize in blocks with equal numbers in the different arms of the, of the study in the two arms, the hemi and the total arm. And the sizes of the blocks are usually a multiple of the number of treatment arms. So if you've got two treatment arms, i.e. hemi and a total, then the block sizes could be two, four, six, or eight. So let's um, examine this a bit further. So how does this help? Right, so you've got a population of patients that you want to randomize and um, you're not very happy about simple randomization because you want equal numbers in the two arms. So what you do is you break up the random sequence in blocks. Let's say you want to do uh, use a block size of four. So the random sequence generated would be in blocks of four, and within the block, you will have equal numbers of the treatment arms, as you can see in the example here. And if you use this process, you will find that um, you will have equal or nearly equal numbers in the total arm and the hemi arm. And, therefore, and, and by this process, you sorted out the problem of unequal numbers seen with simple randomization. Okay, so I hope that, that explains block randomization. You still have the problem with block randomization of having an unequal distribution of the confounding variables you know about. So again, females are represented more often in the total group compared to the hemi, and you've got a lot of smaller tumors in the total group compared to the hemi. So um, you've got to keep in mind that you can still have selection bias with block randomization, especially if the block sizes are very small, and it is known. So. Uh, if, you, if you're going to do block sizes of, if you're going to use fixed block sizes of four or six, and the investigator knows that, then within the block, he or she can figure out what will come next in the sequence. So one solution is to use different block sizes in random. So you could go from two to four to six to eight in random. You could still end up with unequal numbers, but uh, the inequality in numbers is usually not large if you do block randomization. It could be slightly large if you have extremely large blocks, especially if the trial is stopped midway through the last block. And if you're still um, um, interested in block randomization and want to learn a bit more, then I've got a couple of references at the bottom that you can uh, look up. So let's then move on to what we call stratified randomization. So just to recap, We've seen that block randomization may be used to equalize numbers across treatment arms, but it does not address the unequal distribution of confounders. Now, the confounders that we're discussing here in this example are gender and tumor size. These are what we call known confounders because both of these confounders we know about will influence the outcomes of uh, patients with thyroid cancer. So if you randomize patients with thyroid cancer, into a total and a hemi arm, uh, you, and you get unequal distribution of gender and size, then that's going to be a big problem. Do you attribute the, uh, the differences you see in the outcomes to the fact that they've done, had a total thyroidectomy or a hemi thyroidectomy, or would you attribute it simply to the fact that there were more um, female patients in one arm and more um, low risk cancers or T1 tumors in one arm? So that's a problem. So what do we do? So we can do a stratified randomization, which means that to try and distribute the confounders equally, you do the randomization process separately by the confounder. I'll, I'll show an example in a minute. 
Now, in theory, this can be done for any number of confounders. You can do it for um, age, uh, tumor size, gender, and so on. But let's just focus on one confounding variable, um, and in this case, gender. <coughs> so how do we do uh, stratified randomization by gender? So we know that thyroid cancer is more common in women. And let's just assume that in the general population of patients with thyroid cancer, the male to female ratio is one to two. And what you es essentially want is you want one to two ratio of men and women, both in the total group and in the hemi group. So what you do is you consider the female population first, then generate a random, se uh, random sequence in blocks. So do the block randomization if you like and allocate women, females, to either the total or the hemion. You then generate another random sequence for men, again in blocks, and um, allocate men, or the male gender, to the total of the hemions. And this way you ensure that both arms of the trial have an equal distribution of uh, the female and the male genders. Right, so that so much for stratified randomization. So essentially, we um, learned that in stratified randomization, you do the randomization pro uh, process separately for each of the confounding variable. But the problem is that for many outcomes in uh, surgical research and in clinical research in general, uh, the outcomes can be extremely multifactorial in that it's not just gender and that can influence outcomes, but a whole range of factors. Like um, you see on the screen, you've got gender, tumor size, age, BRAF mutation status, family history, coexisting nodules, and so on and so forth. These are just things that I uh, came up with, thought about in a few minutes. So if you have so many different confounders, you're going to have a problem. How many times can you repeat the randomization process and, um, for each of these confounding variables? So that becomes impractical, not feasible. So that's the problem. What if there are multiple confounders? And the stratified process will not be effective or um, feasible. So you use a special technique called minimization or otherwise called covariate adaptive randomization, quite a complex sort of phrase. But essentially what this means is you're trying to minimize the imbalance in the confounding variables. And you do this by adapting the distribution of the covariates. When we say covariates, we mean confounders. So what you really do is you start off random allocation, and then subsequently allocation of participants is based on the characteristics of participants already in the trial. This is slightly problematic, because in my opinion, this is not truly randomization. But the big advantage of minimization is that it enables you to ensure that all of the confounders are fair, that you know about are fairly equally distributed in the two groups. This is quite a uh, complex sort of uh, uh, process to undertake, and, and therefore this is something we really ought to leave to the specialists, the people who really know how um, uh, to do this, pro this procedure correctly. Again, there's a reference at the bottom of the screen for you to look up if you're interested in more detail. Right, cluster randomization. I mentioned this briefly in my last tutorial, Essentially, this is randomization in clusters, by which we mean that the unit of randomization is not an individual patient, but a group. So you could say, for example, that you're randomizing all the hospitals in England um, to either the treatment group or the standard group. And if it's a total versus hemithyroidectomy as in thyroid cancer, you randomize the hospital and say that for all low-risk cancers, you will need to perform a total and another hospital may, be, uh, may have to perform a hemithyroidectomy for all of their low-risk cancer patients. It doesn't really work very well for surgical research in general. There are exceptions. And this kind of randomization process is usually used for complex interventions. Again, and there's a reference at the bottom of the screen for if you wanted more information on this. Right, I think we'll now move on to blinding in randomized control trials. We talked about uh, blinding uh, briefly in the context of the paper that is presented uh, today. So essentially blinding in randomized trials is where the stakeholders of the trial, 
are unaware of the treatment assignment until the end of the study. And stakeholders in clinical trials essentially are patients, assessors, i.e. people who and assess the outcomes, people who provide treatment, analysts, and report writers. So typically, if you blind patients, that's called a single blind trial. If you blind assessor, that becomes double blind. If you blind treatment providers, that'll be a triple blind trial. And you don't really see uh, more levels of blinding than a triple blind trial. Occasionally, people have um, encouraged and talked about blinding analysts. When you send the spreadsheets to your statistician, you tell them, you give them data on treatment A, data on treatment B. You don't tell them what treatment A or B is, so they're completely in the dark. And they will do all the analysis they need to do and um, uh, compare treatment A and treatment B without really knowing which one is which. And another level of blinding, just, just sort of interest, that's been proposed is where you blind the people that write the report. And the people who write a report and the discussion and say um, that uh, talk all about A and B without really knowing what is A and what is B. They'll make a conclusion that A is probably better than B. And then the whole the report goes off to maybe the editor of the journal that's going to publish it. And then the editor will be able to unmask A and B. And that's just talked about. It's, um, you know, it's probably not necessary, but um, a lot of uh, medical um, clinical trials involving medicines um, may be amenable to that, especially when uh, these are commercially uh, funded and sponsored. And you really want to ensure that uh, no kind of bias or pressure creeps in, especially on the authors writing the report. Right. I just want to emphasize uh, this uh, statement. And a lot of people confuse these two terms, blinding and allocation concealment. They're very different. They're both very important in RCTs, but essentially allocation concealment is where you conceal the, uh, the sequence from the investigators enrolling patients. Blinding is where patients, assessors, and treatment providers are unaware of treatment assignment. So they're, very, um, they're quite different conceptually. <coughs> right, how does blinding help? Essentially, it reduces bias in how outcomes are assessed, and these include things like performance bias and ascertainment or detection bias. Now, does it really help? Does it really matter? Again, something that a lot of people ask, because you go to a lot of trouble trying to blind your patients and your treatment providers, your surgeons, and so on, if possible. Uh, and, uh, um, and there's also a lot of cost involved. But there are uh, there is a lot of work that has gone on that has um, looked at whether Trials that are done without blinding show the same effects or the same effect sizes as trials with blinding. And uh, these um, studies have shown that unblinded trials show greater treatment effect than blinded trials or tend to exaggerate the effect sizes. So on that basis, we've got to conclude that blinding does really help. <coughs> Is it feasible? Not for many surgical trials, it isn't. You can't blind a patient in a trial comparing medical and surgical treatment, obviously. And you'll also struggle to blind a patient comparing a hemithyroidectomy to a total thyroidectomy. And sometimes you may not be able to blind um, the treatment providers, but you can uh, certainly try to uh, blind the assessors. So not all levels of blinding may be possible in many surgical trials. However, it's something that we always need to keep in mind some people go with the assumption that surgical trials can never be blinded. They're obviously not correct. And it's important to explore feasibility of blinding in whatever trial you come across. And if you manage to do blinding, it's always useful to see if at all you can measure the success of blinding. Right. So what happens if blinding is not possible? What can be done? Now, one of the things that can be done that's very effective is to go back to your outcomes and to see whether the outcomes are as objective as possible. I mean, an outcome such as pain or quality of life is clearly not an objective outcome, but an outcome such as death or a tumor marker, such as thyroglobulin in thyroid cancer, might be a very objective outcome. And if you can't um, ensure blinding, 
do um, see if all your confounders can be adjusted as much as possible by using one of the more appropriate types of randomization, such as stratified randomization and perhaps minimization. Also, see if you can ensure in a surgical trial that the care providers are balanced across groups. You want to try and avoid um, having surgeons operate on patients just in one arm of the trial. And if you do have a slightly subjective outcome, and you see if you can validate the assessment that's been made by the assessors. So, for example, if you have radiologists reporting CT scans looking for lung metastasis as a marker for recurrence, and if you're not able to blind the radiologist to whether the patients had a hemi or a total thyroidectomy because they can see whether a remnant thyroid lobe is there in the neck or not, then you could potentially ask two different radiologists to look at the whole set of CT scans looking for recurrent disease. And finally, uh, acknowledge that you haven't been able to blind when you're writing the report and, and, um, and submit that as a limitation of your trial um, with proposals of what, what other outcomes could have been used. So in a trial comparing hemi versus total thyroidectomy for lorus cancer, is blinding possible? Anyone would like to uh, uh, take up uh, this question and try and uh, think aloud as to um, whether blinding is possible, what levels of blinding may be possible for what outcomes? Gio, you want to have a go? Yeah, yeah sure. sure. I was just waiting for someone else to volunteer. Yeah, I was hoping um, as well. Uh, right. So, um, well, you cannot blind the surgeon uh, that's performing the procedure. Yeah. Uh, but you can blind the patient because um, the scar will be the same. Yeah. Um, and you can blind the assessor of the outcome if you wanted to. They don't necessarily need to mm, to be involved in the procedure itself. Depends um, on what the outcome is. So if the outcome yeah, is yeah. thyroid cancer, then you really don't need assessor blinding. True. But if the out outcome is say recurrence and um, uh, neck recurrence, then it'll be fairly it'll be almost impossible to blind because if they do a scan of the neck, the radiologist they'll know if the thyroid is there or not. Yeah. So those are things to think about. Yeah. Any, yep. any other thoughts? Um, you could blind stakeholders. I mean, it's not going to make a massive difference, but you can. Uh, like uh, analysts, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Patient blinding, again, um, um, it is possible. At the end of the day, uh, the scar length may not be too different comparing uh, um, between a hemi and a total thyroidectomy. However, hemithyroidectomy patients may not will not need thyroxine treatment postoperatively, while total thyroidectomy patients will need it. Then you've got to think about whether you're going to blind the thyroxine tablets. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. So, so those, it's just to think about the um, the potential in trying to reduce bias from all sources while you're designing the trial. And that's why the, uh, these kinds of national multicenter trials um, are um, designed by a big team and they spend a lot of time thinking about the various aspects of uh, randomization, blinding, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's good. Right. Um, I don't know if um, perhaps Victor, if you don't mind, Victor, uh, do you want to try and uh, match the following for me? On the left-hand side, you've got some phrases and terms. On the right-hand side, you've got their meanings and explanations. Do you want to have a crack at this? Yeah. Uh... So let, let's start with allocation concealment. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot, but uh, don't worry about making mistakes. We're all here to learn. And I can always cut your answer when we release the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, allocation concealment is... So you're concealing something, and who are you concealing it from? <laughs> 
Okay, I'll put you out of your misery. So you're concealing the investigator recruiting patients into the trial. Yeah, from the random sequence. Because you don't want the investigator recruiting patients to know what comes next. Because if they know what comes next and they think a particular patient will not be suitable, on subconsciously or subconsciously, they will avoid recruiting that patient. They look for exclusions. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's mass recruited to the random random sequence then? Correct. Correct. Blinding. Let's go to blinding. A anyone wants to pitch in, pitch in. I think we're running out of time as well. Uh, blinding stakeholders being unaware of treatment assignment. I would yeah, say. Very good. Minimization. Uh, we said it's a special type of randomization meant to balance multiple confounders, I believe. Very good. Uh, use of blocks in the RCTs, block randomization. This helps to ensuring equal and expected numbers in uh, these different treatment arms. Yeah, great. And cluster randomization. We discussed at the end, it's used in the yeah, evaluation of complex interventions. Yeah, it's the only one left as well. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Right. So just to summarize what we've um, discussed, you've got to keep in mind that there are two important parts to randomization. One is the generation of sequence has to be done before the trial starts. And the other is that we need to try and ensure allocation concealment. These are really, really important. We talk about different randomization methods. I think we'll all do well just to remember simple randomization, block randomization, and stratified randomization. Any randomization method needs to reduce selection bias. Block randomization will help achieve similar numbers in both arms. Stratified randomization will help distribute uh, uh, one or two confounders um, equally in both arms. More complicated uh, types we don't really need to know about, um, and we can always get help from uh, um, people much more qualified than us to help us with it. We talked about blinding. We said blinding may not be possible in surgical trials, but uh, we should uh, seriously consider it. If one level is not possible, we should look at other levels, and we should think about how best we can um, blind at least at one level um, patients getting enrolled in surgical trials. Thank you very much.